Hello and welcome to the Franchise Tag Podcast with me, your host, Freddie Hall. I am back. I know I was away all last week. I had uh, some well-deserved time off when I had a little holiday with my partner in Edinburgh, but still got to watch all the games on the way home, made sure I got home and had a nice bit nice bit of Chinese and watched the evening games. And uh, yeah, it was what a weekend of football we just had. Thank you, Andrew uh, and Adam as well for holding stead while I was uh, while I was away. And you guys did a fantastic job like you both always do um but yeah i'm back we're back uh we are missing adam this evening unfortunately because he is a bit poorly um but adam will be on the other podcasts later in the week with the fantasy show and the sunday preview show as well hopefully and we wish him a speedy recovery but we are here franchise tag podcast for the old fan new fan and the uk fan make sure you check out our affiliates star sports betting for all your nfl betting needs this season you can find them in our affiliate program on our social media and uh, make sure you put f tag as the code for when you join to make sure they know that we sent you there but star sports betting go check them out for your nfl betting needs uh strange weekend of nfl i feel like andrew i feel like it's been a weird week lots of injuries now we're getting to that crunch time where these bit wins and losses become even bigger um when we're looking at the playoff pictures that is now only what like a month month away we you know we've got into december and now it's it's full gear ahead for when the playoffs happen yeah i mean um we've had prior to the week just gone the last couple of weeks we've had some right random scores so there was some sort of normality this week with the scores but uh yeah lots of injuries again uh seems to be the common uh factor of this year lots of big names going out so yeah. uh but lots of good games so still yeah, lots of good games, but there's some bad games as well. And there's some bad teams out there as well, which is what we're going to talk about. So usually, you know, the rundown of these shows now, we usually bring a point, we discuss it between us. However, in our fantasy football group chat, we we, we talk about fantasy football. Of course, we also talk about general football, football in general. And the conversation came up about the Seattle Seahawks, because we have a couple of Seattle Seahawks fans within our, our fantasy league. And they were just discussing about, you know, what's been going wrong for them. They looked really bad against Washington. Um, then we looked at like, well, let's have, what have they done in the draft? And it, suddenly this like, really, all of us were getting very involved with going like, hang on, what, what's going on? What is going on with the Seattle Seahawks? So, and why? And then me and Andrew discussed more and said, well, what what happens with franchises that, that can be so, so successful? And then suddenly there's a massive downturn, especially when they have a lot of pieces. And, you know, in this game, the most important factor is the quarterback. And Seattle have had Russell Wilson now since 2012, and he's been an A star, A plus quarterback for them. And you would assume when your quarterback is A grade, that the team is A grade. But this is this is not really what's happening with the Seattle Seahawks, unfortunately. They lost 17-15 to Washington in the Monday night game. They're now three and eight, which is bottom of the NFC West. And they're now second bottom in the NFC division, um, only in front of the 0, 10, and 1 Lions. And, and this is not what we usually get with the Seattle Seahawks. They are a historically very good franchise in the recent years. So we're going to look at sort of what has happened with Seattle, but also as well in the grander context of what, why do these franchises swing and go? And oh, is it more of a back house thing? Is it, is it the, the coaching? Is it the team on the field? And what changes maybe some of these franchises in the NFL need to do to, to be get, progress and be better? Um, so, Obviously, we, we there was things about the draft, which uh, drafting with Seattle, which we'll talk about in a moment. But Seattle were the team at the start of the year that were like, well, this this team could top the division at least come second, and they're definitely always chalked in for a wild card spot. Um, what's gone on with Seattle this year, Andrew, for this downturn? I've got some stats in here as well to back up some of the points we're going to be talking about. Um, I, I did. I only watched the highlights of the Washington game. I don't know if you watched the full game. Um, so you you go ahead. Well, the highlights wouldn't have taken you long to watch if you watched them. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, with the Seattle Seahawks, I think before the season's start, we always kind of like remember who they used to be and remember what they mm. did. And they have got some really nice pieces. When Russell Wilson's playing, he can win on his own. He's got that ability. And we know he's got DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. You know, there is some pieces there. But we've always known the Seattle team to be have a really, really good defence. And I don't know why we think that, because it's not. <laughs> um, it's been declining every year since it was the Legion of Boom sort of thing, since you started watching. And it hasn't really replaced or turned around. You know, Pete Carroll is a defensive-minded coach, and you kind of think, oh, their defence is good, and Russell Wilson on his day can beat everyone. So we've always put them in the conversation of they've got to be good. Don't write them off. 
Um, you've seen what happens when they lose one running back. The, the whole team dynamic changes as well. Mm. Um, and that's just not great uh, going forward, really. So for me, I think we're clouded by their past to what they are now. And I think it's very obvious when we watch them season on season of what they need to improve. So, and, and I know as an NFL fan, you can sit there in the chair and you can criticize and you can say, well, we need this, you need that. You know, we don't know, you know, the money and things like that and draft and draft capital and dynamics and stuff like that. It's not as easy as, as we can, as we do in the armchair. However, every year we've looked at the Seattle team and gone, well, they need a stronger offensive line. And they need better. They need better defensive players. Need they? They, they have have tried to be. I feel like they, when they traded for Jamal Adams, it was a bit of a cover up story, because it was great. It was a good trade. I, I you know I was happy that they did the trade, and I, I thought that it was um, uh, what they what they spent on it. On it, I thought was actually very reasonable for the time Jamal Adams was if not the best or what in the top three safeties in the league. However, he's not really performed. I don't think that at that level still in Seattle. And that felt like, well, you know, they've done something. They've, they've drafted, they've traded for a big time defender, still got pieces like Bobby Wagner. They brought in people like Carlos Dunlap, who wasn't a, it well, that was a big splash, but it was a player that they need, that they needed um, on the defensive line. However, these little moves have been really just like a cover up for, Really, the whole problem of which is they draft really poorly, and they and they're not and they're not um, solving the problems that are happening within the team. Offensive line has been an issue for what feels like five plus years. Um, they brought in Gabe Jackson from the Raiders when he went on to free agency, and um, or they traded for him. I'm sorry, I can't remember which one it was. I think they did trade a low round pick for him. But it was one of the conversations that we had in the group chat was this team just can't draft. Like I looked earlier, they've had four Pro Bowl since um, twenty since they won the Super Bowl, which was in twenty thirteen, beat the Broncos, and I've got all their season records saying how far they got. They've only not got to the playoffs once, which was in twenty seventeen, and they went nine and seven. In that time, though, they've pro, they've had four Pro Bowl players they've drafted, and that was Frank Clark, who's no longer at the team, DK Metcalf, and Tyler Lockett, who we know are just fantastic, and Michael Dixon, their punter. So, you know, they, they, they've, they've not got one of them players anymore. They traded them away and traded them to the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and then they've got two class wide receivers. I mean, that duo is just incredible. DK Metcalf, people knew he was going to be decent. I don't think people knew he was going to be this good when he, he got into the league. And then, you know, punters are people, as to quote Mac, Pat McAfee and, and NFL in general. But punter, a Pro Bowl punter out of, you know, how many players that they've drafted in that time why is that not working out for Andrew? Because it feels like Seattle is, is a smart organisation. Pete Carroll's been a very successful um, coach wherever he's been. Um, he, the John Snyder, the, the, the exec vice president, the general manager, is revered as being very good. Um, but Pete Carroll is the vice president of exec vice president of football operations. Do you think that that dynamic of him being in there is what is affecting the, 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 the draft and, and not being able to get in the plays that you need? Yeah, I think what's happened here is um, <clears throat> when he first joined the Seahawks back in 2010, you know, he was straight out of college. He'd done fantastic things with USC. And I think, like I've said in previous shows, I feel like first year coaches out of the college have a real good draft because they know the players, they've seen them, they've watched them, they've come up against their team and they know other people in other camps. Yeah. And we saw that with his is 20, the 2010 draft and the 2011 draft when they when they drafted all of those incredible defensive players i think what in in those years they picked up uh Russell Okun, uh Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, KJ Wright, Richard Sherman and we kind of went like wow he really knows what he's doing and then after that they kind of just gave him i think i think the the owner of uh the Seahawks passed away and his sister took over for as the ownership of the of the team and kind of like went, oh, what do I do? I'm not really into sports and kind of gave more power to Pete Carroll and said, mm. Pete, it's Pete Carroll's team. You know, he's seen what he's you've seen what he's done of the advice. And then we just let him have more power, draft players. And it's really just not translated since then. Um, as you've said, you know, they've had. 
what, what I think I mentioned it earlier, they've had sort of like 10 draft picks, 11 draft picks, seven draft picks. Every year they've got multiple draft picks mm. and they're not, they're not hitting on any of them. Mm. Uh, and at some point you've got to address and say, well, who's making these picks? Why are they bad? I mean, two Seahawks fans in our group, they agreed with everything I said when I was like slamming their drafts. They have had, they, I, I will admit I was very harsh because as uh, our friend Matt did say, they did pick up a couple of good dra- draft picks in 2020, but you know, they're, um, they're players to build on rather than they've, they've been mm. like fantastic straight out off the bat. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, he's been given more power. He's drafting badly. He's fallen out with Russell Wilson and he's created a bit of hostility there. Mm. And he's supposed to be a defensive minded head coach and the defense is getting poorer and poorer and poorer every mm. year. Uh, so I think they really need, someone needs to grab hold of that organization, tell him he's a defensive minded head coach and get someone in mm. picking the draft picks who knows as a general manager mm. and let the general manager be the general manager and the head coach be the head coach for me. I think I think think you're right within when we look at organizations around the league that have that coach empowerment like Bill Belichick in Patriots that's like a classic one that's been there for so long his drafts in the last few years have been woeful they have not hit on anyone in their drafts really they've been really bad I mean what they picked like three tight ends over the course of two years and none of them I started well. Look what they did in the off season. They went and signed two tight ends, even though they've been drafting tight ends to replace um, Hernandez, really, from the start. When and then what? Then Gronkowski. But now Belichick took a step down, and from from that, and they drafted this year with their new guys. And look how well it's worked. Their draft has, has done really well. You look at teams that have got very stable general managers that have just come in, but have been notoriously unstable. Cleveland Browns with Andrew Berry. I mean, they are hitting on everyone in their draft. They are doing so well. I mean, their draft, people like, um, who's their tight end? Bryant, players like that. Like the, these players that are in deep rounds that they're hitting on. And I think you're right with Pete Carroll. He, he needs to sort of let go of some of this ownership of there. But it's it's hard to take away power from someone when you've been given the power is the only problem. But for the good of the team, they've got to do it. And you touched on a good note here of Russell Wilson. Can you blame Russell Wilson really for for we we there has been no absolute certainty that these guys have fallen out or that Russell Wilson wants to go anywhere. That is actually really never that's never come out. Considering the NFL players can be very vocal about leaving, wanting to go. That has never really transpired with Russell Wilson. He's uh, why he's my favorite player in the NFL. You know, it, it's because he leaves it all on the field and he's private and he understands that team. You know, he he leads from the front. He knows if there's a leak going on with him, there's a leak going on everywhere in that Seattle um, organization. That would not be good for the team. However, the rumor has been for what feels like nearly two years now, a year, that he will. He is looking to go. and But can you blame him? He runs around for his life. He's He's been screaming for an O-line for years. They have given him weapons. That is fair. They Tyler Lockett um, and DK Metcalf, they got there. Chris Carson has been a fan. He's the only player of when we were talking about drafts earlier that is a low-end pick that has been a success. However, he is now he's out for the season. He's been injured a lot of the years. They've spent a fair time picking Rashad Penny. That was an absolute waste. Um, so they've given him a couple of things, but they've not they've not given him the defense that he had then, and they've not given him the O line. And he was the afterthought when there was Legion of Boom. When that was all encased, it was like, yeah, Russell Wilson's great, but he's not the team. And really, he was the team the whole time. And now he is the team. That the, the Seattle organization needs to give him what he needs and needs to repay the favor of him being not in the limelight for a very long time and allowing the defense, to, you know, the defensive players of Cam Chancellor, Richard Sherman, um, Earl Thomas, all to be in that limelight. And and now he needs to be repaid by the Seattle organization. I've, we've spoken about it for many years and I've said it on this podcast for many years. See, Russell Wilson is the most underappreciated quarterback for the area. I feel like for, for the organization, I feel like they do not appreciate enough what they have with Russell Wilson because there are teams out there who are not getting this right at quarterback and they've had it right since 2012 when they drafted him. When you look at Jacksonville with Trevor Lawrence, you, you look at um, 
well, lots of these teams around the NFL, but is their quarterback really the right guy for them? Even good teams, Minnesota Vikings, is Kirk Cousins going to be the one going forward for a long time? No. Um, uh, Denver Broncos, who've got such a stacked roster, you know, they can't get the quarterback right. The Seattle Seahawks have, have got the quarterback right for since 2012, and they've only capitalised twice, really. They've got to Super Bowl back-to-back -back years. They won it and then lost to the Patriots. They have got to the divisional, like I said, um, every time other than 2019, 2017, sorry, where they went nine and seven. However, they've only gone to the divisional three times. They lost there. They've lost in the wild card twice. What With Russell Wilson, do you think at the end of the year this is going to be... If, the, if they do a lose, if they have a losing record here and... He, it's seen as maybe or painted that it's a little bit his fault or something like that. Do you think that is the last the straw that will break the camel's back for Russell Wilson? I mean, being a Giants fan and being and having rumours that Russell Wilson every year to come to us is fantastic, but something that the Seahawks have like for Pete Carroll, Pete Carroll Seahawks, they've never won without Russell Wilson. You know, the first two years, 2010, 2011, seven and nine record, not good. You know, mm. we've seen when he's injured, they're, they're not good. So mm. if I was the Seahawks and Pete Carroll, I'd be doing everything I can to make sure Russell Wilson comes back next year and is committed. Mm. Um, so I go all out on keeping Russell Wilson and getting him an offensive coordinator as well. Mm. And like I said, let Pete Carroll take care of the defence. And then what you're looking at as an organisation is a full defensive rebuild. You're not essentially, O-line needs to be rebuilt, but you know lots of O-lines need to be rebuilt. There's plenty of them in the drafts every year. Mm. But you're not looking at a complete organisational rebuild. If you lose your quarterback and that defence stays the way it is, you're rebuilding a whole franchise, not just getting better on defence. So I do everything I can to try and keep him, resolve this, and make him happy, what, whatever it needs to do. Because I think if they lose him, they're going to be in a bit of trouble. And I think Pete Carroll might have to move on uh, if, mm. if Russell Wilson goes. And I, I think he's, he's, still, he's still good enough. You know, he's proven to, that he is good. Mm. They just need to start doing some things right. And when you look at other franchises that have been through this sort of, sort of scenario, you just briefly touched on it yourself. The the Patriots. Bill mm. Bilacek is a defensive-minded head coach, but he has a fantastic offensive coordinator. And now the team is moving forward. You know, McDaniels is that good. The Bills were struggling. McDermott has got Dayball as his offensive coordinator. Mm. You know, they need that's that's how you start building your franchise. You know, if that's how it works. All the other teams have offensive-minded head coaches, and mm. that seems to be how it works nowadays. You know, that seems to be the way the NFL is moving. So for me, you, they've got to keep Russell Wilson, whatever it takes. I don't think losing him is an option. Do you think that is also when we talk about franchises that are, are, are doing more, well, are doing better? When we're looking at the coaching level of it, not like the managerial level or back house of it, do you think that synergy is what makes an NFL team successful? Is that you have that court head coach say that is either offensive or defensive, but they have a a, a guy next to them, whether they be a defensive coordinator or an offensive coordinator, that they trust twofold. They they believe everything in them and they leave them to it because and and but also you need to have that person to be talent. You need that coordinator to be talented as well. And you know you, you can hit on a lot of that. There's a lot of miss as well. If I look, I look at the Steelers, you know, Tomlin, a fantastic defensive head minded head coach who has had offensive coordinators, but has not been getting it right. And it's the exact same with Matt Canada. The offense is not working under Ben Roethlisberger. Now there's a little bit more schemes wise. He has an offense that people believe is built for more a uh, younger mobile quarterback and it's not translating with Big Ben. But do you think that that is one aspect of, of, being able to maintain success for a very long time is to how it's it's not just a head coach it's it's really a two man a two man or two women or or, or, or a team job really that keeps this, these organizations pushing forward and being successful 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, you only have to look at um, the Miami Dolphins with Brian, Brian Flores. You know, fantastic defensive mind. Defense is good. Hasn't got a very good offensive coordinator. Same with the Broncos. Look at their roster they've got. You know, Vic Fangio, defensive minded, hasn't got an offensive coordinator. Look at their record. You know, there could be so much better there. Uh, so I think it is about having that balance of your back of house staff um, and getting that right and having the trust and being, and then you can just be a head coach, you know, and, and then just get, get your team connected, get them on board, get them, get like everybody singing off the same hymn sheet and just do your job well. And then everybody, like I say, like I said at the start, everybody's doing their job well. So mm -hmm. you know, GM's doing a GM's job, head coach doing a head coach job, or, or coordinator's doing a coordinator's job and quarterback will do a quarterback job. Mm -hmm. now, that's how it works. And it's proven the teams that are doing well now, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. there, there is a blueprint for how to be successful in the NFL. We, and, and, and what's even worse is it is no secret. It's not like a secret sauce. It's not like the 12 or 11 herbs and spices of KFC or whatever it is. It's not secret. Everyone knows how NFL works and how to be successful in the NFL. Why do organizations not follow the blueprint and therefore become uh, and therefore are not unsuccessful? The Browns were unsuccessful for a very long time. They got it right now. They have now got it right. They have got the, the right GM, the right head coach, the right coordinators. You could argue the right right or wrong quarterback, but for argument's sake here, the right quarterback, because that's it's working in their offense. Why does it take so long for organizations to not cotton on to it? You need to be A, a in every department in back of house all the way to quarterback. And that is what is successful. You look at pe people like Jacksonville Jaguars who are, have not been successful for a very long time, or Detroit Lions, where it's just not been right. And wh why... Why do organisations struggle so much to, to be successful when they know how to be successful? I think the issue is that you've had at the Seahawks and you had it at the Patriots. They get a couple of – the head coach gets a couple of Super Bowls mm. and they get that sort of legendary status. And then they want it to be <clears throat> their team and their team going forward. Mm. Uh, and I think that's where the disrupt comes. You I mean, take a look at the Kansas City Chiefs, Andy Reid. He doesn't really get involved, does he? No. He just turns up, runs the team of what his organisation have picked for him and goes, I'll do well out of that. You know, that that's that's what you need to be. You, you need to understand your role, understand your position and not not really get out, your, like, out of your box because mm. that's when problems start to happen and you get, you know, the problems that you've had in Green Bay and the problems that you've had in, in Seattle – where if a team is reliant on one person, whether it be a head coach, quarterback, a wide receiver, or whatever, and they feel like they are the team, it then produces problems throughout because mm -hmm. you've got one person doing more than they should do. So, yeah, it's just, it, they, are, they all just need to look around at what the teams that are doing well at the minute are doing and go, huh, funny enough, mm -hmm. why are we what not doing that? Well, when you look, when we discuss this, let's look inwardly at our own teams, for example. Like, where, where are the giants? Like, because I think this is what's even funnier is you can really just pinpoint it. Like, you can just look at the ladder of going owner, GM, coach, quarterback. That's the four. You can easily pinpoint out the four where that goes wrong to where there is then no success or, or lack of success. So, when you look at the giants, where for you in that four do you go like, there's a problem here. That's that's how it's then going to get. That's how we're going to be successful. Or, and I suspect this anywhere of the Giants, when there's multiple things wrong in that four, what, how easy do you, and why do you think that organisations maybe don't address that quickly enough? And, and do you think it's a timing thing, a money thing, or is it that they believe and we're just on the outside looking in? I suppose. I mean, when you look, you're looking at the the New York Giants. It's it's, it's very easy to assess as well. Like we've just <laughs> the simple steps of looking at what you're doing. And I said, you start off at the top with your GM. New York Giants have got a very bad GM. David yeah. Gettleman has not proven. Well, it, but even further than that, the owner, John Mara, the owner, has been a very successful, good owner for a very long time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, if you want to go as far back as that, but you know, they're just appointing what they think's right underneath. Mm. And you could argue that he's not got that right this time. Um, but, you know, he's being let down. 
Uh, he's been let down by his GM, first of all. He's not, he's, he's never been right um, for the position. Like this isn't isn't just this year that the Giants fans and organization have gone. He's not getting it right. Um, and then you go down, and I think to the next level of Joe Judge, and I don't think he's not getting it right. I think for me, he is doing what's asked of him. He is being a head coach. You know, I think when you're looking looking at him, he's not get, stepping out of his box. He's just trying to win games. They're in games. You know, there's been lots of games we've been in, um, yeah. and there's lots to sort of take away and go, we need to build on this, we need to build on that. Yeah, we've been injury-ridden. His whole offense has been sort of shot all year. His star of, like, our franchise star is our running back. He's yeah. been out for, <laughs> for ages um, so I wouldn't necessarily Joe, say Joe Judge isn't doing the right thing, mm. but he's not had an offensive coordinator do the right thing for him, and they've addressed mm. that finally, and now you've seen him step away. So, and you, there's talks of Dave Gettleman either retiring or being kicked out at the end of the year. So mm. it looks like the Giants have finally gone light bulb moment. Let's try and get this in order. So for my organization, I feel like there's something to go for there. And when you talk about the quarterback and say the quarterback doing the quarterback thing, I can't knock Daniel Jones. You know, he mm. is he's is is a great he could be a great quarterback. He's just got, needs to polish those errors because those errors really shine too bright for me. But you know, he's he's not stepping out of the box, he's not outspoken, he's not blaming anyone every week mm. on when, when his press reviews, he just, he's not had the guidance, I don't think, to move to the next level because he's got all the attributes mm. you'd want. You know, if he walked yeah. into a room and you said, what attributes do you want from your quarterback? He'd tick all of them. Mm. He just It's just not translating on the field at the minute. Uh, so for me, the Giants uh, are aware of their issues and they look like they're making changes. Mm. So I'm happy with that. And it's it's changes that have come maybe quite swiftly. I mean, Dave Gettleman has not been at the Giants for that long a time, um, but obviously historically a very good franchise and one of the cornerstones really of the NFL, really, in, in the same as within my organisation, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Whereas uh, the Giants, I feel like, have been... You've had to be progressive recently because of Eli Manning really retiring and stepping down was just not great anymore. You held strong with what, which is sort of what the Steelers are doing in a way. We're holding on to Ben because we're loyal to him and he's done so much for us and he won us a Super Bowl and stuff like that. It was the exact same thing the Giants were doing. And it is hard to then cha change and transition. But you've got to be A in all your departments to be able to then transition very smoothly to get that right thing. And like I said, with the GM not being a, an A, he's he's drafted maybe the wrong people at the wrong times, maybe. You could argue Dan Jones. However, I, I believe the same as you. I think Dan Jones is perfectly capable, but he's not been able to draft everything else that is needed. Therefore, there's been discord and movement and changes within the coaching the coaching's been changing every other year apart from joe just now being in job what two years now so th there's not stability there you need stable and a plus a lot across the board and that daniel jones is, is getting that hopefully but then there's movement again so i can expect with you unless you hit a on the gm again this time well this time there is still going to be maybe some problems for the giants moving forward but hopefully you can get that gm position sorted and then move forward from there. Joe Judge then gets better players to work with. And then Daniel Jones gets better players to be able to protect him and play with as well. And when I look at the Steelers, you know, we've got we, we've got such historic roots, the Steelers in the NFL, the Rooney family who are owners who, who have been fantastic for so long. Um, Kevin Colbert, who's been a very, very good GM for us for a long time. Mike Tomlin, you know, we only had three head coaches ever at the Steelers, Bill Cower, and then um, I always forget the other guy's name, but which is awful as, as a Steelers fan, but uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, mine slipped. Um, and, and then we've been A at quarterback for a very long time. It's only now that it's not A at quarterback. And it's it's having the goal and, the, and, and to be able to go, right, this needs to change. And I think it's very hard for organisations who have been very stable for a very long time to then change. Um, but you've got to you've got to adapt to it. The Kansas City Chiefs did it. They said they went right. You know, we've got Alex Smith and we're very competent and we're getting. We've got Andy Reid, who's a really great coach, and we've got um, the, the right GM. It, well, the GM was John Dorsey, then into the other GM that they had, which I can't remember his name either. And good owners, and 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 it, and it, they were fine. 
like they were good. They were getting to the playoffs, right? And they were they were qualifying. They were having a good year. But they needed to then step up. They knew if we're going to win the big time, we've got to step up. We've got to take the risk. We've got to transition. They take Patrick Mahomes. They move up for him. People did not see Patrick Mahomes now, what he is now when he got drafted. That People did not comprehend that that would happen. However, it has happened. And it must have been hard to have that conversation to go, look, we can only go so far with Alex. We need to step it up. And they needed to trust a young new quarterback that people were not. Andy Reid admits, I did not think that this was going to work. And it has worked and it's been very lucky for them. But the, but the teams who take that risk are the ones that are succeeding. The Kansas City Chiefs, the Baltimore Ravens, the Buffalo Bills. They're all franchises that have taken the risk to move forward. And that, I think, has to be the thing is that you've got to take these risks. And... The, the risk now for Seattle, I think we get, you know, round circling back to Seattle. The risk now is going, right, do we do we move off of Russ here? Because we feel like the organisation is fine. There's just, you know, they, there's, there's maybe problems they don't think there are in the back house, but it is more on the field. Do they clear house and start again? And, or do they now just, you know, maybe take hold of that organisation again, pull Pete Carroll out of th that position that he's in and go, no, we're having a proper GM in here. And that's how we're going to build our team again. How easy do you think it is for organisations to have this sit down, have this conversation, whether it's the owner and the GM or the coach, and, and to sort these things out? I think when you're looking at the Seahawks, when, if, if that's who we're talking about for this, I think after the season they've had and the record that they've got, I think that's quite an easy conversation to have at the end of the year to say, look, we love you, Pete. You've done fantastic things here. Mm. Can we try something new for next year? You know, what have they got to lose? You know, so I think it's a problem when you've got you've got people like like the Steelers when your conversation is like like you used to have with me all the time with Eli Manning. You've got the conversation of going, do we let Big Ben play until he says he doesn't want to because he's mm. such a massive personality player, what he's done for you over the years? Mm. Can you do him wrong and say, you're out, mate. Mm. You know, or do you let give him time to say on his own accord, it's time for me to go? Because mm. that's a difficult conversation. I think with the Seahawks, when you're as bad as what they've been, it's a slightly easier conversation. And you're not saying, Pete, you're out. Mm. You know, it, you're done. You've not done well. It's, do you want to just go back to bases and build this defense mm. into, you know, that incredible defense that we remember? And we'll give you some offensive coordinators. We'll keep Russ. You know, someone else will take care of the drafts. Don't you worry about it. I think that's a, a lot easier conversation than uh, mm. getting rid of people. So uh, I don't see why that should be a problem. I would like to reiterate as well, we're not seeing this Seattle are like historically bad or they've, they've been bad currently. Like the, their records since they, like, since they won Super Bowl, 12 and 4, 10 and 6, 10 and 5, 9 and 7, 10 and 6, 11 and 5, 12 and 4 in an infamously quite hard division. So we know the Seattle Seahawks have been very good for a lot of years. And we're not saying that they've got that, but they have had bad defense for a long time. They have had no IU line for a long time. I'm sorry, but four of these wins each year, maybe even five, are Russell Wilson. That's the conversation you should be having. But Russell Wilson is five wins a year. What if we had a team around him? Because they wouldn't, they're, they're five wins, you know, with Russell Wilson. They wouldn't. They wouldn't be twelve and four. If they had a great team around them, they would be more like fourteen wins, maybe thirty. No one goes unbeaten. I know it's crazy to think that, but the, 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 these conversations need to be happening with Seattle. Of we have a quarterback here. We have problems in this organization. We need to take the hard pill. The pill that is hard to swallow. Look inward at something that has been working, but now it needs to. We need to reshuffle it. and need to revitalize it. I think. There's a lot of stubbornness in the NFL. There's a lot of stubbornness amongst NFL fans and NFL podcasters and NFL players, I'm sure. But there is definitely a conversation that every organisation has to have where they need to definitely shake it up for the better and of the organisation. The Cleveland Browns didn't look at the success that they are now having. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of teams have to look in the mirror sometimes. It's not always pretty and it may not even be very popular amongst the fan base. But if, it can be, if, if they want to succeed, that is the conversations they need to be having. Um, thank you for joining us once again. Sorry, it's been sort of a one-topic thing, but we explored different aspects of it. And uh, 
it, to be to be brutally honest, we love having Adam here, and we've been both very busy. So we, you know, this was a topic that we thought we definitely discussed because it is relevant to a lot of teams. Um, however, we've got more podcasts coming this week, which I'm sure will be fun as well. The fantasy football podcast on Thursday with Andrew. Definitely heating up the fantasy football now. Only two weeks left of the playoffs. This guy's in the playoffs at the minute, but how long can I stay there? It is remained to be seen. It is week on week. Every game is a, a, it's a very important in fantasy football now, so make sure you're catching that. And we'll have the Sunday preview as well. Thank you, Andrew, for joining me. Have a good week. We'll see you all very soon. <laughs>